Hi. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, international conference on aluminium alloys uh, for inviting me to give a talk uh, as part of the characterization symposium. Um, it's been challenging times for all of us, so I really appreciate all of the efforts that have gone into making this happen. Uh, today I'm going to give you a, a bit of an overview of uh, atom probe tomography and from the, the basics of the technique and also give you a few examples of how we can use the technique to uh, investigate segregation to crystalline defects and the influence that this may have on phase transformation. So I'm the group leader for atom probe tomography at the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung, MPIE. MPIE is in Düsseldorf, somewhere in the west of Germany. And uh, we are a fairly compact campus with four departments. So this is MPIE, this is the entrance. This is me at the atom probes. Uh, this is me trying to pretend that I know something about metallurgy. And this is me in front of the uh, wonderful group of uh, early career researchers with, with whom I have the chance to work. And the group um, has the, it's quite well equipped. Uh, we've been very lucky. So we have three um, state of the art uh, atom probes, um, three fibs, including a, a plasma fib. And I'll get back to why this is important uh, a little later during my presentation. Um, the group has about 20, 25 people. Uh, half of them are PhD students, a bit more than half is uh, postdocs, and then a couple of technicians. I know this makes up more than one. Uh, and at MPIE, we also have access to a whole range of different uh, other instruments, um, SEMs and other FIBs, and uh, a few TEMs, and Kelvin probe microscopy, for example, and also um, a, a very um, a good access to facilities to cast new alloys and to process them. Um, so we've been <coughs> able to um, work on a lot of model systems and I will touch on some of these afterwards during my presentation. So first and foremost, I want to talk to you about how Atom Probe works and what are the fundamental mechanisms that uh, underpin the, the technique and also how we, we get data and process that data. So what happens when we apply a very intense uh, electrostatic field onto uh, the surface of a, a material? Actually, the, the field itself can um, be, if it's sufficiently high, can start to push the atoms from the surface away and force them to uh, become ions. And as soon as the ion is created inside of this uh, electrostatic field, it gets accelerated away from the surface. So we can use this as a way to project the surface atoms away from the, from the, the surface itself. This process, turning surface atoms into ion, uh, ions, is uh, under the influence of an electric field, is referred to as field evaporation. And this is this process that uh, underpins atom probe tomography. The magnitude of the electrostatic field that is required to cause field evaporation is in the range of 10 to the 10 volts per meter. And to reach such a high field, the simplest way is to create a, a very sharp needle. And at the apex of this needle, um, the electric field is more or less the voltage that we apply divided by the radius. So if the radius is in the range of below 100 nanometers, um, and with voltages in the range of just a few kilovolts, we can reach electrostatic fields that are in the range of 10 to the 10 volts per meter. If we look at the way the electrostatic field uh, is distributed at the apex of this needle uh, for a crystalline specimen, the field is not homogeneous all across the specimen apex or the specimen self face near the apex. And there are locations right at the edges of the atomic terraces where the electrostatic field is slightly higher. 
And what does that mean for us? It means that these atoms are going to be removed first because the electrostatic field is what causes the field evaporation, what pushes these atoms away from the specimen surface um, in the form of ions. So how does atom probe tomography work? Well, we take this um, sharp needle-shaped specimen and we cool it down to below 80 Kelvin, typically. And then we apply a high voltage of a few kilovolts. Locally, at the specimen surface, when the field is high enough, we start to cause field evaporation. So we transform the surface atoms into ions. And these ions in the electrostatic field surrounding the specimen are accelerated away and projected away from the specimen surface. They travel through a counter electrode, which actually helps reach a higher field for a given uh, voltage and we collect them onto a position sensitive detector. So for every ion that strikes the detector, we can record the position of the impact. And this will be important later on, as you will see. To trigger the point in time at which this uh, field evaporation event takes place, we can either use high voltage pulses or laser pulses because the field evaporation process is typically uh, thermally assisted. So we can use laser pulses to temporarily increase the temperature of the specimen's apex, or we can use the high voltage pulse to temporarily increase the magnitude of the electrostatic field at the specimen apex. Both of these will lead to an increased probability that the atoms from the surface turn into ions, field evaporate, and get projected. So we can time control the, time, the, the point in time when the ions are created, which means that we can use this as a start for the measurement of the time of flight of the ion from the specimen up to the point where the ion strikes the detector. And this time of flight allows us to derive the elemental nature of the ion because a light ion travels fast, so it has a low time of flight. A heavy ion travels slowly, so it has a long time of flight. And all of this is more or less proportional. At the end of the day, we use the information from the position sensitive detector and the elemental identification to build a three-dimensional um, point by point uh, reconstruction of the distribution of the atoms from within the specimen initially. The first information that we get from atom probe tomography is a mass spectrum. So for every ion that we've collected, we get a time of flight. The time of flight gets translated into a mass to charge ratio. If we zoom in on this mass spectrum, we can see that we have a series of peaks corresponding to individual isotopes of the different elements that constitute this piece of steel that we've analyzed here in this case. So what atom probe tomography gives us is an access to the relative amount of a specific element with respect to all of the others that are within this, the sample. So the local composition in a sense. Now, if we look at the way the data is collected, um, what we get for every single one of these ions on the position sensitive detector is, for example, this sort of map. And if we go through a, a, a given data set dynamically, we collect all of these points one after the other. For every one of these points, we have information on the time of flight and we have this positional information. If we look here, there is a pattern that forms that is not uh, uninteresting. And if we look at the uh, histogram version of this, uh, we actually form a pattern with different uh, lines and uh, what's so-called poles and zone lines. And interestingly here, um, this pattern is um, uh, can be used to retrieve some crystallographic information from the specimen. So you can see that these lines have specific symmetries that we can use to identify the crystallographic nature and orientation of the, uh, the material at that point in, during the analysis. As you could also see, the, the pattern is a little bit 
blurry somehow. We don't have the full atomic resolution. And this is in part because the distribution of the electric field, as I have mentioned before, um, is not completely homogeneous at the specimen apex. And there are regions of slightly higher field, regions of slightly lower field at the specimen apex. And this causes uh, trajectory aberrations. So the path of, of the ions is not as straightforward as we would hope. Uh, and there are aberrations either the ion is pushed slightly away from its expected trajectory or there can be some slight uh, atomic displacement on, on the surface before the uh, atom transforms into an ion and gets projected. We also have a limited detection efficiency. Not all of the atoms are detected and this comes from the um, microchannel plates used uh, at the entry phase of the uh, pos um, position sensitive detector. And this is these microchannel plates are used to transform a single ion striking the detector into a cascade of about a million electrons that is collected by the anode, the anode be giving us the, the positional information. So if we start with a, a, a nicely crystalline uh, specimen with atoms on their crystalline lattice, uh, what we end up with within the reconstruction is a bit more of a, <laughs> a, uh, an amorphous structure, if you wish. But there is always uh, hope to gain some crystallographic information from, from within this point cloud. And um, sometimes it, it, it can be very useful to retrieve some more um, information from the, the material. These aspects for the specific case of uh, the analysis of small particles, uh, especially in aluminium alloys, uh, is been treated recently quite in a lot of details by uh, Frederic de Gozer and I. And there will be a, a presentation on this as part of this the uh, International Conference on Aluminium Alloys this week. The reconstruction itself works as such that for every impact, as I've said, uh, we recall the impact position um, on the detector. And what we assume is that the ion has flown following a straight line from an emitting surface. And so we can reverse project this detector position directly onto a, a virtual emitting surface, if you wish. So, we have a specific magnification corresponding more or less to the size of the specimen, the radius that we have, and the flight distance. So we can take this position on the detector, reverse project it onto this uh, virtual emitting surface. And every time uh, we, we process one of these ions, we move this virtual emi emitting surface down by just a tiny small amount that is proportional to the size of the atoms, the volume of the atom that we have processed and the, the size of the specimen. Again, we don't detect all of the ions. So some every single ion that we detect will have to account for a little bit more than its own volume in when we reconstruct the depth. And then we do this sequentially for every ion that we detect, we will reposition it onto this virtual emitting surface. So now the final result um, of this process is a three-dimensional point cloud. The result from this is a three-dimensional point cloud, as I said, um, where every point has a color. The color is um, corresponds to the, the element. Uh, for example, for that piece of uh, industrial steel that was acquired more than 10 years ago now. And we can look at where all of the different elements are distributed within the small volume of material that we've analyzed. Small being about 100 nanometers in uh, field of view, lateral field of view, and a few hundreds of nanometers in depth. In this case, we can see that, for example, there is a large carbide in the middle of the data set um, located at a, a grand boundary. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of features in the distribution of vanadium, for example, that correspond to segregation of vanadium to crystalline defects, dislocations, um, and to the grand boundary itself. And then we can look at what is the composition of the different particles and, and parts, sections uh, of the microstructure that we've analyzed. If we look at a, a typical microstructure here with grains that we can reveal um, or look at with SEM, for example, or EBSD type techniques, and then we can zoom in on, use the, the 
transmission electron microscope to look at more structural information that we can get from from these samples. But the we, what the atom probe does well is complements these techniques by giving us the um, distribution of the different elements. For example, we can see that in, in this case, um, we have segregation of vanadium and nitrogen to dislocations within the matrix. We have these different particles that are also rich in vanadium. Uh, we also have distribution of solutes inside of the matrix, so we know what's not yet used, um, what, which is, what is left in the matrix for further precipitation, for example. We can also look at um, grind boundaries and the distribution of solutes at these grind boundaries, which can be extremely challenging when we, we deal with a, a projection technique like a, a transmission electron microscopy, for example. So the atom probe is really powerful in complementing existing uh, techniques and providing brand new insights into um, the distribution of the elements within in three dimensions within some of these very complex materials. Now we are done with the introduction, um, so let's con let us consider uh, an example of the iron manganese system. So if we look at uh, interfaces and structural imperfections within the, the crystal lattice, um, it, it, th then it's known that they uh, tend to have their own behavior with respect to the distribution of solutes. So we can consider its locations or stacking folds or interfaces such as grand boundaries, for example. And so these can attract solutes and solutes can get trapped because of the strain field, because of local uh, bonding that can be different, so local thermodynamics. And these have been treated differently by, you know, Cottrell, for example, and the Cottrell clouds and Suzuki for the segregation to stacking folds and Gibbs for the segregation to interfaces. And yet at some stage, it, it, these segregations locally um, mean that there is a different composition that can lead to a specific way that phase transformation can start from these different defects. And this is a, an area of interest to us to see how this um, different elemental segregation can affect the, the further nucleation of, of, the, of different phases within the, the, the... So how does this change in local structure and composition changes the, the, cha the, the thermodynamics locally and affects the, the formation of new phases afterwards? We've been working at MPIE for uh, probably the best part of a decade on the iron nine manganese model system, which is a, a model system for med many medium manganese steels. And uh, we considered an alloy that is uh, iron nine manganese and follows a, a fairly standard um, heat treatment route uh, with some cold rolling in between to in introduce um, crystalline defects and reduce grain size. And when we look at this sample, um, interestingly, after heat treatment uh, at, for six hours at 450, uh, if we look at the stress strain curve, there is this uh, yield point phenomenon that typically arises when uh, interstitials go to the, the um, uh, dislocations and pin them down, which was not completely expected from such a, a model system because manganese is, is it's not interstitial but substitutional. And upon doing atom probe, uh, what we see is um, a significant um, uh, segregation along these linear features that were proven to be dislocation by complementing these atom probe studies with transmission electron microscopy. If we consider that data set, for example, uh, from the same alloy, same condition, um, we can see that this, along these dislocations, um, the composition of manganese is actually not homogeneous and there are fluctuations in this composition um, from a minima to a maxima that is very reproducible across the different dislocations that we can see. And in that case, uh, we can use the information from the, the detector map, as I've mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, it, it is relative to the crystalline orientation of the specimen. So we can see at different positions within the data set, we have slight uh, changes in the position of these different poles and zone lines, which is an indication that we have crossed a, a, a grand boundary and yet another grand boundary right there at the bottom of the data set. So we can look at the change in orientation from one grain to the other. So the first 
crime is a crime boundary is a low angle boundary it's made of a series of dislocations that as we'll see in the in the next slide and then the bottom one is a much higher angle crime boundary uh, with about 10 12 degrees so um, it, it just has a very different behavior as again i'm going to talk about afterwards um, so if we look at the low angle grind boundary we see that it's effectively made of this uh, array of, of dislocations and along these dislocations the, um, uh, the the fluctuations in compositions are similar to what we've seen within the bulk and um, at, at the high angle grind boundary it looks much more like a film uh, but again there are fluctuations within this film that uh, go from more or less 12, 12 atomic percent manganese to about 25. And interestingly, uh, this difference in composition between the, the low and high um, composition in manganese is what we would expect at this temperature between the ferrite and the austenite in this alloy system. As we keep proceeding with the heat treatment um, a bit further, we can see these uh, regions it's at the grand boundary where the composition is um, compatible with what you would expect from, from gamma. So we can't really, the austenite, so we can't really confirm that it has transformed already. But when we see these uh, gamma-like particles, we also see that the amplitude of the fluctuations uh, in composition is slightly lower. And as we keep proceeding with the heat treatment, in that case, for example, for two weeks, we see that Gamma, these gamma regions at the interfaces keep growing and we don't find these uh, uh, fluctuations in the segregation to the boundary any longer. And as we keep going for two months, for example, here we start we have uh, large uh, gamma particles that have grown. So just to summarize, um, as we keep proceeding with the heat treatments in this uh, alloy system, uh, interfaces start to get populated with uh, manganese, more and more manganese. And as more and more manganese comes at the interface, uh, we see these um, fluctuations in the compositions that are forming. Um, actually, the iron manganese system has a, a miscibility gap. So what we think is that locally, uh, as the composition increases, we, have, we form a, a local spinolol uh, fluctuations. And at some stage, the, the composition gets high enough that gamma becomes uh, the most likely phase to form. And then uh, as gamma has started to form, it can just keep growing as the uh, heat treatment proceeds. So now, how is this relevant to a conference on uh, aluminium alloys, will you ask me? Um, well, we, we've done similar work in aluminium. Um, in you might have seen uh, Juan Zhao's work during the Early Career Research Awards uh, sessions um, uh, this week. If not, I invite you to go and, and watch it. It's quite cool. Uh, so for aluminium, it was a bit more of an issue for us in the atom probe field to prepare specimens specifically from grand boundaries because most specimen preparation involves a, a focused ion beam and these are typically made of gallium. And so if we take this beautiful data set, for example, where we have a grand boundary in this uh, model uh, 7000 series aluminium. We can see the distribution of all the elements as you would expect, but also gallium goes to the grand boundary and inside of the precipitates. And the way gallium is going to affect the distribution of the other solutes is unknown and it makes us very um, wary of the, of the results. Over the past few years, um, xenon-based plasma focused ion beams have been made available more widely, commercially. And so we, we acquired one uh, in 2017 and we started preparing atom probe needles from aluminium uh, based on, the, on the, using this, this machine. And we can see here, for example, we have a, a certain map with a given orientation and this grand boundary where the, the orientation breaks down and we have another orientation down there. And so we're quite at so that point in time uh, that we didn't find much uh, xenon inside of the specimen, maybe just a little bit at the top, and we could analyze um, aluminium alloys confidently uh, at the grand boundaries. 
We also obtained very clean results with no gallium implantation by using a, a cryogenic stage to uh, during the, the final stages of, of focused ion beam milling. And this will be presented also this week um, by Lola Lillenstein. So I invite you to attend that, that talk as well. So we took a model 7000 series aluminium alloy, went through a whole series of retreatments, looked at the precipitation sequence. All of this is summarized in Juan's uh, first uh, paper on this. And then we also studied the evolution of the grand boundary composition and the grand boundary precipitate composition. And this again is uh, the subject of another article published uh, last year or two years ago now. So I invite you to have a look at what Atom Probe can do for the uh, aluminium alloy um, in, in this context. So I think for me, it's the end. Uh, I wish to thank you for your attention. And I want to thank all of the co-workers I've had at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Eisen Forschung over the past few years and, um, and the, the very kind people who've been supporting us financially to allow us to do uh, cool work. Thank you.